Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Leslie Hawthorne, and this is... My name is Chris Lam. Excellent. Uh, so uh, I have the honor of being a former board director of the Open Source Initiative. And I have the honor of being a, a current member of the board. Of the board. Yes, excellent. So uh, we are here today to talk a little bit about what the Open Source Initiative is, uh, some of the history of the open source software movement as seen through the lens of the OSI's involvement and uh, historical interest in how things have evolved, uh, to tell you about the OSI's mission and how that is relevant to you as folks who are engaged in the open source software community, and uh, to talk a little bit about uh, software licensing and some of the legal bits. So if you're here for community or for law, you're in the right place. So without further ado, Maybe some ado? Maybe the other one. Hit the other one, okay. Boop. <gasps> it totally worked. So how many folks in the audience are familiar with the Open Source Initiative? Okay, so I see several hands, that's great. Uh, for those folks who are not familiar with the Open Source Initiative, which I'm just going to now call OSI because it is shorter, uh, the Open Source, uh, the OSI is a uh, nonprofit organization. It is a nonprofit organization incorporated according to the laws of the United States. And the mission of the OSI is to be the steward of the open source definition. So if a company or an organization or just a person says that something is open source, it actually needs to be open source as defined by the open source definition. How many folks know of the open source definition? OK, I see a few hands in the room. We'll get into that a little bit more later. But the fundamental takeaway is if a company comes along and says, we, uh, we have this great new open source hardware product, and there is no hardware specification, there are no schematics, there is nothing available to actually reproduce what they have created, the open source initiative will call upon them kindly and let them know that they are misusing the term. So uh, the idea here is, again, the consumer can have faith in whatever the producer is creating, that when it is called open source, it really actually meets the definition of open source. So uh, the OSI, in addition to having individual membership, uh, has a huge affiliate member program where we partner with various uh, free and open source software projects to um, help them accomplish their mission in a variety of ways. So as you can see, this is like the wall of logos of folks who have joined OSI as affiliates. If your open source project or open source organization is interested in partnering with the OSI so that we can be of mutual benefit to our members, that's great. Uh, please let Chris or I know, and I can get you in touch with the right folks. And he is the right folk, so maybe it's faster to go to Chris. So origins. Op before open source, open source is free software. Um, we are not going to have the tired free versus open debate today. In fact, we would like to propose something entirely different which is that uh, these are concepts that are, um, what, what, what do we want to call them? Not mutually exclusive, right? This friends. is this, yes, exactly. They are friends. They are, uh, in my perspective, they are two different ways of looking at the same question. So we may recognize these two folks on the screen, uh, Mr. Stallman, Bill Joy, the creator of Unix. So once upon a time, uh, all software was what we probably today think of as open source. If you purchased a piece of hardware, for example, a printer, you would get a copy of the source code that would run on that printer, and it would you know, arrive to you printed out on you know, reams of paper because this was you know, a long time ago. And the great thing about that was if people were making use of a hardware device, such as a printer, and there was a problem, they could then have access to the source code and modify that source code in order to make an improvement. So the, the canonical amusing tale of this is that there was a, an error, I believe, with Xerox printers. And they would jam on every third page. So people would be sending print jobs to the printer consistently, and then no one would understand why their documents were not printing, because apparently printing has always been hard and always will be hard. So uh, Richard Stallman had a great hack, right? He thought, OK, well, I can't fix what's wrong with the printer hardware. This is just a failure of the hardware. But I can change the software so that every single person who has sent a print job into the print queue gets a notification, go check the printer and unjam it, because otherwise, no one's going to be able to print. So it was a, a way to route around hardware failure using human, to, human intervention. Fantastic. So then one day. Uh, new printer comes to the office. 
There's no source code included, but unfortunately, it has the same hardware failure after every like, third page at jams. And Mr. Stallman wanted to, again, modify the software so that he could do this human intervention action. And because there was no source code available, this is when the free software movement is born, right? Richard Stallman goes to the, the printer vendor, I believe it was Xerox, and says, you know, where is the source code? I'd like to make this fix. And this is when he learned about the concept of non-disclosure agreements and the idea that these, this source code was being kept as proprietary as, an, as a trade secret for the company because they felt it gave them a competitive advantage. And he felt that this was a huge violation of the hacker ethic because people should have the freedom to make changes to their devices and to make changes to software code as they see fit. So this is uh, the definition of free software from the FSF. So basically, free software is software that provides users with the four freedoms. Are folks familiar with the concept of the four freedoms? OK, I see a few hands going up. That's cool, because we have them. Nope. Right there. So the four freedoms are that you have the right to use the software, right? You can run it on your machine. You can run it on whatever machine that you choose to run it. You have the right to study the software. So you have, actual, you have access to the actual source code in order to be able to understand how the program is working on your device and to ensure that it is working in the way that you expect it to and that you intend it to, to work. You have the freedom to improve the software. So it's not just that you have access to this, uh, this code that is up an integral part of your daily existence. You can change it, right? You can make it better for your particular use case. And finally, you have the right to share this software. So it's not simply that you can take it and make changes for you that are beneficial to you, but then you can, if you wish to, share those changes back with others so that they may make use of it. So these are the four freedoms. Use, study, improve, and share. So as we all know uh, from eating delicious cupcakes out uh, in the foyer yesterday, uh, open source is now uh, 20 years old. And uh, I just want to thank uh, the OSI sponsor, Adblock Plus, for getting us all these awesome cupcakes and helping the OSI to celebrate its 20th anniversary, because the uh, cupcakes were delicious and the cake is not a lie. Uh, so open source has become the proper name for this concept of free software. And I realize what I've said is probably quite contentious, and we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. But there was, at one point, uh, a, a severe stigma against this concept of free software, because unfortunately, the English language is not nearly as exact as German, which my German friends in the audience can attest to. Uh, there's no word in English that means both free as in you have freedom and free as in cost free. Like, we don't have two different words to describe this. Like, we don't have Kosten, Lost, and Vrei, yeah? So we had just have free. And of course, as you are attempting to create a business ecosystem and that depends upon the use of software as part of your business model, if you talk to the folks in the room who are cons concerned with your profit and loss statements and tell them, we want to use free software or we want to publish free software, their immediate response is, how are we going to make money? This is a problem. And, and businesses were, were concerned about the idea of using free software or developing free software because they were concerned that this was an impediment to their ability to do business and make a profit. And you know, if you're engaged in business, that's your goal, is to make a profit. So there was a, a meeting of several technologists uh, at the, I think it was at what be, eventually became the OSCON conference. And a woman by the name of Christine Peterson suggested that it would be easier to understand if what was known as free software became known by the term open source, right? This was less threatening to people's concept of uh, freely modifiable, freely studyable, freely exchangeable code because it didn't immediately invoke this, this sense of uh, what business competitive or anti-business sentiments, right? Nope, we already talked about that. So, Open source software lets users and developers advance software freedom at work as well as in private. So the idea here is that because you have these rights under the open source definition, according to the four freedoms, you can both develop software that fits into the specifications of the four freedoms on your own, and you can also do it within the workplace. 
So the first decade of open source. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir a little bit on some of this stuff. I bet all of us probably know about the first decade of open source. Anybody new here, new, sort of new to the free source, open source space? You are totally lying, but that's OK. We totally appreciate you. Um, <laughs> So this will perhaps be, be more beneficial for folks who watch the video later, and uh, we, are, we are pleased that, to have you with us. So here is a, a decade timeline of open source, and, and it's, a, it's a time of both advocacy and the promoting of the idea of open source and a time of controversy, right? And this, this first controversy arose simply over the naming, right? Naming is a very powerful thing, and for, for many people, they felt that the move away from the term free software to this term open source gutted the concept that source code was a, uh, a type of free speech. So it is a way in which a developer can express herself with complete freedom and say whatever it is that she wishes to say through the creation of her software. And you know that, that like, caused a huge rift that I think is um, well, I think just think it's sad. Like, I mean, now if you look at the, the Open Source Initiative Board of Directors, there's th I think there's three board members who are all members of the Debian Project. So I don't, I don't think we need to stress their bona fides and the concept of like free as in freedom, right? But you know, for a long time, this, this caused a great divide. And you know, I, think, I think we're getting past that. Yeah. I'm hoping so. Yeah. yeah. So Absolutely. this is a, a fantastic timeline, which you can all read yourselves because you know how to read, and that's fantastic. But there's a... Uh, in addition to this, this kind of um, community-based dissension, there's also uh, an era of let's all perform uh, many different lawsuits because uh, we are going to prove if our licensing model depends upon, our business model depends upon the licensing costs of proprietary software, uh, that this uh, model for open source free software is problematic and we are going to crush it. So you have SCO is doing Unix. You have the, the, micro, the, the famous statement that Linux is a cancer from Microsoft. There are a whole bunch of people running in and influxing to create new software licenses that they feel will fit their business model effectively and trying to modify existing software licenses like the GPL or to, um, you know, creation of new licenses like the Apache software license, the MIT X11 license, in order for effectively developers to be able to articulate what their expectations were for engagement around the software that they had created. So this is where you should chat, because you are the licensing expert. Mm. So I'm going right. to hand it over to my colleague. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, so what, what actually made open source licensing succeed? So um, as you can remember from the previous slide, there was a lot of contention, and um, particularly in the, in the business space, um, which required some sort of crystallization of consensus, as we like to say. Um, around what the licenses really mean, like who, who or who has sort of not control but stewardship over over these over these concepts. Um, also, you know what what conversations can people have around um, open source licenses and licensing in general, and you know, etc. Things like that. And, and do we want these um, conversations to be uh, sort of top down or do we want them from a consensus base from a community point of view? So this is um, perhaps captured by the multilateral uni unilateral um, divide. So do you want like a, um, a company saying this is what a, a big company with a lot of power and money saying this is what licenses are and what they, what they mean? Or does it want to be much more community basis, and well, not necessarily community, but consensus basis, so we can have a, a lot more uh, uh, just basically review or, or um, just people that are in agreement? Because, um, I mean, the, the whole idea is all about sort of shared definitions and shared working assumptions. So if you have that's a top down approach, that's not necessarily ideal. So, yeah, open source licenses are um, a consensus of the norms for a community. Um, and the open source initiative, um, its main job is to be the steward and, um, and crystallize that consensus into one and say, you know what, great, you think this, you think that, um, but we think that the, um, and the, the cons we believe the consensus view um, is that a uh, no particular open source license means this, or a, a, the whole concept of open source means something quite particular. And that shared definition is basically how we can all sort of rub along together just by our um, 
perhaps commercial differences or, or ideological differences. So the, um, the goal of the OSI's board is to um, uh, approve and um, well, one of the many purposes of the board, but um, here it's, it is to approve the, um, uh, any licenses that come on um, that are suggested to us and whether they fit the open source definition. And the open source definition has all the rights necessary for um, to act, all the rights necessary to exercise uh, the four freedoms, which Leslie outlined earlier. Um, so this is like a brief um, overview of that consensus in action. Um, we would receive a, a request to review a license under, you know, um, dear OSI board, oh, we have this license. Do you think it? Um, do you think you could approve it? And the, this goes through some of the the technical. Um, stages and steps that one would have to do to do that. Um, if I may just add something please. to it. Um, so if you are a uh, free software legal nerd, please do subscribe to the license review list and just follow along because there is, uh, and not only can you watch this process in action, but there is so much legal talent that is specialized in free and open source software on this list, both folks who are trained as legal professionals and people who have done a lot of in-depth study on their own. And I think it's also important that folks realize that the, the review process is not just carried out by the OSI board. This list is composed of people throughout the community from uh, various projects who comment upon ways in which the license uh, m matches the open source definition or ways that they feel that it, it does not and how it could be improved. The final step is for the OSI board to, uh, to understand the discussion that has happened as part of the license review process and then to provide final approval as to whether or not the license meets the open source definition. And obviously the board exercises their own judgment, but typically once the community is satisfied that a license is compliant, the board will approve. We understand that we, you know, are collaborative experts in this in this arena, and then, you know, again, a new open source license might be born. Yes, it's very much a consensus-based approach. There's no sort of top-down king um, idea where, um, okay, you, you you guys all think this, but we're just going to say that the uh, that this is not OSI approved or or it is approved. Um, it, it's based on the thoughts and feelings of the community, um, but also from these, these legal experts here, things like that. Um, here's an interesting point. Um, op um, open source doesn't have business models, but um, um, companies do. So um, one um, other advantage of open source licenses is they isolate communities from um, their members' business models. So um, this means in practice that the OSA won't grant um, particular exceptions um, in licenses just to fit your particular commercial needs. I think Leslie can speak to some yeah. examples there, maybe. So it's, uh, it's so c conceptually, right, businesses want to be able to operate in whatever environment that they're operating in according to rules, right? This is why we have legislation, regulations, et cetera. We need to know what are the rules of engagement when we operate as a business. Um, and in, in this way, open source licenses allow businesses, to, when, when we talk about like isolating the community, like there is a very specific way in which the business can understand how they operate with their software and that folks in the community who may wish to contribute to a project that is uh, either uh, sponsored entirely by one company or that may be uh, uh, worked upon by multiple companies, right? Every single participant understands the rules of engagement because it's codified within the license, which tells you exactly how you may use, study, share, and I am very silly and just forgot the fourth freedom. <laughs> Help um, me. Share. No, I already said share. Oh. We do like sharing, though. Use, study, read, improve. Thank you, improve. Yes. Wow, I need to improve. Excellent. So um, it, when, we, when we talk about the OSI will not approve um, exceptions to your license, um, I've seen any number of folks come by saying that they really like, oh, I don't know, the Apache license, but they'd like to remove the patent indemnification clause. So can we just have the uh, Apache license without indemnification clause license, please? Because it's better for us uh, when we're running our business. And the OSI simply doesn't approve these changes because if you're trying to make your business model uh, workable by taking an existing license and modifying it or creating your own brand new license that says this thing can be open source, but I'm still allowed to have these proprietary bits on the side and call the entire uh, code base open source. 
we're not, this is not something that the board is going to do because the license provides rules of engagement according to a pre-existing framework, which is the open source definition, and licenses have to conform to that even if it's a brand new license. So you, for example, don't see like the, I think the big one was the NASA open source license, which has been very difficult for a long time because NASA, being a scientific body within the United States, wanted to release their software and very early in the days of the license approval process came up with their open, open source license, which was totally okay with the United States government to publish as open source. So this was a huge big deal that the United States government was happy to give away this software under an open source license instead of uh, under a public domain copyright law, which is very problematic for various reasons. Um, but now it's very hard for people to incorporate the software published by NASA into their own works because the NASA open source license has all these extra specifications that were very specific to that time and place where it was created. So again, that we've moved away from that as a model and now it's very structured and very like, you know, we're not going to make something with 18 million little sub variations for you because it works well for you. We're going to fit into a framework that is simplified, streamlined, and makes it very easy for people to use and reuse what you've created. But Leslie, I need, I need my own license. Well, I, mean, I need to have my name on it. So vanity licenses are bad. <laughs> um, I would suggest that instead of this, we will find a different way to make you feel like you are well-loved and well-appreciated. Thank you. Oh, yes, you know, we're all about the love here. <laughs> so why, why did open source win in this first decade? It won because, um, as Leslie just mentioned, reusing licenses and reusing definitions beats re-implementing your own. I mean, you just saving time right there, not uh, working out these 18 variations on an existing license mm -hmm. when you basically just want to use that existing license, yeah. like, and, like, essentially things like yeah. that. And, uh, you know, also on, along those same lines, right, um, people were very excited to use open source once they had a set rules of engagement around it because who wants to recreate the same things over and over and over again? And I think if we look at the pace at which uh, technology change is happening from the perspective of software development, it's entirely driven by open source, right? Suddenly, instead of having to uh, reinvent each component each time within a particular group or organization, people can build upon existing building blocks to create the final product that they're really most interested in creating. So if you have uh, the LAMP stack or you have the MEAN stack and you can just build on top of that to create the thing that is your special sauce for your company, your app, your website, et cetera, whatever it is that you're selling, again, it's much easier and much faster, and it's because of this you know, shared body of knowledge, and no one has to keep reinventing the wheel. Absolutely, and this, this streamlining process of thought means that you can just essentially just get your work done. You aren't spending weeks and weeks uh, negotiating what sort of license. You can just be like, okay, yeah. I'm using LampStack, it's under these shared assumptions, mm -hmm. I can work with other people based yeah. on that. Uh, yeah. And let's just move on. Let's just do something actually productive instead of um, whiteboarding, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So the second decade. So open source has grown up a bit. And Ta -da. so we have seen open source proliferate, right? But at this, at this stage in its existence, like most open source software, instead of being uh, out front and center, a lot of it, again, going back to the LAMP stack, is infrastructure based, right? So uh, you know, how many, you know, we wouldn't see the likes of companies like, I don't know who's some of the big guys, Google, Facebook, Netflix, et cetera, today, if there wasn't this core infrastructure available as free and open source software, because there is no way for any organization to innovate and scale up to a huge number of uh, servers if they're paying, you know, a per license cost for every single one of them, right? That just would not have been possible. Um, so again, we go into this era where the entire ability to do web services is built upon the free and open source software stack. And a great deal of the software that is written in order to create um, what was once upon a time called the Web 2.0 movement is itself open source or APIs released under an open copyright. Mm. Um, One thing that underlines the success yeah. of open source and the, the, the term open source perhaps might be that it's the word open is now being used to express other um, similar related parallel-ish concepts. For example, open hardware, open data. I mean, um, and this speaks to the power of, of the, the stewardship and how, how names basically yeah. really do matter. Uh, mm -hmm. um, license enforcement was also... Um, <laughs> it was a thing. It is a thing. <laughs> Less of that. 
Um, so a license is only is only valid if if you um, if you comply with its conditions, pretty obviously. And any and people who violate licenses should be expected to um, pay some sort of cost, social, monetary, etc., something along those lines. Bring themselves into compliance, really, right? Yeah. Um, hopefully, it would never reach that because of this sort of consensus view that if a particular license means this, then why would you why would you go against that? Why would you um, enter that community? based on those shared assumptions and then not play by the rules, et cetera, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think, I realize this may be very different for folks in, in the audience who are from Germany because I was, uh, got a great education in some of the ways in which uh, there's patent trolling occurring in uh, Germany yesterday and I assume the same sort of thing comes up around license enforcement uh, as well, but the idea here, is, for most of my experience at least, is that typically um, companies come into compliance with an open source license through, through requests, through gentle education, not necessarily through enforcement via lawsuits, right? So if you, for example, are um, engaged with people like the Software Freedom Conservancy, and they notice, for example, that there's a GPL violation within a product that you're shipping, like they send you a polite letter and say, we notice this is a problem and we'd like to make sure that you folks come into compliance. And there's like a year or two year negotiation before there's ever any discussion of litigation. So more often than not, people are making simple mistakes. They did not set out to be a bad actor. Companies don't want to put themselves in a position where they're you know, taking on legal risk and liability. So again, there's a, a collaborative process to help people to come in, into compliance with the law of the licensing. I mean, if anything, this speaks to the success. I mean, we've streamlined this, uh, the adoption of um, free and open source software to a point where people are sort of accidentally violating. And mm -hmm. it just, they're like, oh, well, we didn't, that wasn't intentional. It, it was, um, you've made it too easy for us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, in the next decade, we'll perhaps see a bit more, I mean, a number of licenses require attribution. Um, I think uh, the famous example might be the, the, the artistic Pearl mm -hmm. license. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which, which uh, states variously that um, not only must you follow the terms, but you must to um, sort of credit where this, where this sort of code came from, what's the provenance of it, what's the, um, who are the original authors sort of thing. Um, and we believe in the next decade that will be um, attribution enforcement and those sm smaller angles will be more the focus than, um, than straight up, um, um, or we hope, uh, straight up um, Compliance, compliance with the terms of violations license. and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Patents. I'm going to look at you and say you're the legal guy here. Well, I'm <laughs> a, certainly not a patent guy, a patent guy, shall I say, yeah. Um, so, yes, I mean, just to read the first sentence anyway, patents break the safe space on which open source depends. So, uh, what this means in practice is that developers sort of now need permission before they can um, iterate on a piece of software and things like that. You used to be able to just download the LAMP stack and iterate over it, make your special source on top or as part of or replace little bits of it here and there. Um, but patents and patents um, uh, sort of violate this um, sort of soft covenant and they, they really just break up, break up the workflow of uh, developing free and open source software. Um, and, and notably, they must now distrust the motivations of others if you um, you can't necessarily be sure that you have um, um, sort of the rights, the, the, uh, the, the, the lowercase f freedom to, to work on a piece of software if you're not sure if it might violate some patent and things like that and people get scared and move away and so there's sort of less innovation in general in particular spaces. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, So as, yeah. do you want me to take this one? Please, yeah. So as part of the, the OSI's history, so first there was this fo great focus on open source software. And then at a certain point, the, the OSI board and the community that had developed around the OSI realized that there was a need to provide the same sort of guidance around standards as we did for open source software. So there was a definition of what, of what open source meant. And so what is the way in which we create a standard, which we can then call an open standard, meaning anyone can actually effectively implement this standard. There are no secrets or parts of a standard that can only be implemented by one company because they feel like it is going to be a core part of their business model. And you can find this at uh, opensource.org slash OSR if you are a standards geek. So yes, in conclusion, uh, free software and um, software freedom reigns the essential core of 
well, why we're all here today and, and pretty much most software projects um, and things that people are interested in these days. Um, and open source itself remains a pragmatic approach to software engineering as, a, as an idea, a concept, a day-to-day -day, um, workflow and things like that. And um, open source will, is the future. I mean, it, it, it's the past and it's the future and obviously today as well. Yeah. So uh, we have reached the conclusion of our presentation. And if you folks have any questions, we would be happy to answer them. And it is also worth noting that there are several OSI board members uh, in attendance at FOSS backstage. So one, uh, apparently we all have to get a selfie. And two, uh, there are folks around like Alalita Sharma, Denise Cooper. Uh, and so you can find any of us and feel free to ask us about the OSI. We'd love to talk to you about it and why it may be worth you joining as an individual member or having your project join as an affiliate. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you. So, 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 thank you very much. There is a question. Do we, I'm sorry, I should have asked you if we have time for questions. Yeah, we have like five, seven minutes. Cool. Hi, Paul. Hello. Uh, I know there was an issue recently with uh, ZSH uh, and Ubuntu, um, basically the BSD license getting implemented as uh, compatible with the GPL, and it had something to do with a lawyer kind of being uh, relatively loose with his interpretation. Uh, does the OSI have uh, kind of cat sorry, excuse me, uh, a write up on that that's accessible to sort of the casual developer to understand the nuances of that case? Well, there, um, I can't speak to the, the, uh, that case in particular, um, but I believe there is some discussion about that I'm not sure there's a very nicely nuanced yeah. summary view that's readable. Yeah. Um, there's almost certainly a very long thread um, about On it. On license yeah. review. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, it's a complicated issue. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not um, uh, your right to sort of somewhat characterize it as, you know, a liberal interpretation, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a complicated so the OSI doesn't necessarily do like position papers or uh, explications of uh, the law just because it would be beyond the purview of the organization as a, as a nonprofit. Um, and you know, this is when we all get to wave and say, I am not a lawyer, except for Richard Fontana, who really is a lawyer. Um, and for those kinds of resources, like once upon a time, I would look to Grok Law, which sadly mm. we no longer have uh, available to us. But if that's the kind of thing that you're, in you're interested in learning more about and having something that's like accessible to the casual person, like explicating what the heck is going on in this like complicated, twisted thing over here, um, I, I agree that that is an excellent community resource. I don't think that the OSI, based on its mission and charter, would be the, the right group of folks to do that. But what I would love to see... Uh, in the spirit of open source, if folks want to collaborate on something like that, that would be really cool because the one thing that I know about open source legal eagles is we don't have enough of them and they don't have a lot of time to write. But I don't know, maybe we could do like phone a friend, ask your question and, uh, you know, podcast it. Like, I mean, how bad could that be? We could probably get Luis Villa for an hour <laughs> a week that's probably worth, if we yeah. bribe him with chocolate yeah, and cupcakes. So. Yeah, okay. We've got cupcakes. Thank you. That's a really yeah. good suggestion, Paul, because that is, that is a resource that's missing. But even with... Um, these concepts are difficult to, to condense into small things. Even, yeah. even Grok Law, as great as it was, um, it, it was complicated to follow mm -hmm. because these, these issues are, are complicated. So it may be incorrect to try and you know, put it down to like two bullet points. Yeah. Yeah. Alas. So. Any other questions, folks? Okay, great. Well, thank you all for coming. And I believe that uh, we have one more talk before the break. I think so. Am I no, lying no, no. to you? Uh, sorry. Is there one more talk before the break, or do we all go have yes, lunch there's now? Yes, there's one more talk. I was so right. Excellent. Firstly, okay. firstly thank, thank you, for Chris and Leslie. Thank you.